How's it going? Hi, good. You? I hope you didn't get me smearing my lip gloss on. <laughs> thanks for uh, joining us. It's great to chat with you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. So I guess one of the first things I wanted to do to kind of like plow into all of this is we were talking about this uh, before you came on, kind of like how you have been a presence in the left media space for a while. But Gavin and I were both really unsure of what your superhero origin story is. How did you get involved in uh, obviously you're a comedian? How did you get involved in the left YouTube space? And I guess have you always been, you know, active in you know, socialist left leaning politics? Uh, you know, what's that? How did you end up on, on YouTube as one of the foremost uh, political hosts? Well, um, I let's see. How did I wind up on YouTube? Uh, I like that foremost political host. Um, I actually did a show called. So I was doing stand up, as you said, and then I I fell into kind of a radio show uh, and podcasting. And I did the show with this comedian named Heather Gold, who's based on the West Coast. I was called. Uh, she came up with the name Morning Jew. And it was a really great, I thought, show, uh, great con conceit. It was basically we would look at three headlines and determine whether or not they were good for the Jews, good or bad for the Jews, which is kind of a, a you know, a way to mock this kind of self-obsession that some of us will fall into with, like, understandably, there's some historical reasons for that. But like the, oh, is it good for the Jews? So we would do that. And someone um, uh, liked that show and encouraged me to... Uh, try to get on WBAI radio, which I have to get back on because I had some scheduling issues with them. So I'll try to get back on there. Uh, and WBAI is, of course, well, not, of course, is a, an affiliate of Pacifica, which is this free speech uh, radio and uh, KPFK on the West Coast. And um, yeah, I fell in, I So I started doing that as a radio show and I was like, oh, I should probably turn this into a podcast. So I would do the radio show and then I release it as a podcast. And then I realized that I really wanted to have a podcast, so which has different energy from a radio show. And um, I then started doing the podcast that I would play on the radio, if that makes sense. And then with the pandemic, and I'd wanted to do video for a while. And then with the pandemic, I, you know, I did do it. Um, and that's how it started. And then where in the lineup did Useful Idiots come on? Um, I, yeah, I actually started doing Useful Idiots. We started doing that before the pandemic, obviously. So yeah. that was before I started to get into YouTube. Um, yeah, that's sorry. I'm going to adjust my chair. Despite being a oh, foremost uh, host, I'm not that. <laughs> my, my, my studio, like you guys are talking about, I got to up my studio game. Yeah. That's funny. Well, uh, I want to ask you a little bit more about the Useful Idiots thing in a second. But sure. I think another thing that uh, I want to know about and that I feel like a lot of people uh, might want to hear about is your comedy. I feel like a lot of people may not be aware of the fact that you're a comedian too. And in my opinion, um, your comedy is very unique. You know, you don't usually announce, I'm going to make a funny joke. It's usually very dry. Uh, yeah. It almost kind of reminds me of like Bill Murray in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering if you could uh, give people a little bit of insight into uh, your comedic process too and how you express yourself that way. Um, and like, do you do like stand up sets ever? Or is it I, more yeah, just... I used to do stand up. Um, it's funny. I always like when people don't. Uh, introduce me as a comedian because then I get to surprise them as how fun with being funny versus when you're introduced as a comedian, then the, the standards are really high. So, uh, but no, it is part of my bio. I really can't hide from it anymore. Closeted former comedian. No, um, I haven't done stand up in a while. I'd like to get back to it. Um, and uh, I do think that. Uh, Sorry, guys. I'm 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 just recaffeinating myself, so I just want to apologize to everyone. Oh, we're constantly so. recaffeinating and fucking right, up so, on yeah. our show, so don't even trip. Yeah. Um. So comedy. Let's see. Yeah, I did stand up. Um. You know, I do think that there's comedy, hopefully, in in the in the street, the shows that I do. Um. We don't do. I mean, we 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 do sometimes script things, and we have on Useful Idiots, for instance. We have you know Matt came up with this structure. Isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? Uh, Democrats suck, Republicans suck, which is, as his father's friend, who's an old pro in the reporting business said, all news stories fall into uh, all of those, you know, one of those categories. And I do think it's it's kind of interesting how structure can really help create comedy, but that's not really what you what you asked. And that's an example of how I, I'm not following the structure, just kind of uh, free for all in it here. But yeah, I, I haven't done it in a while. You know, what's it also kind of funny is that when I was doing it, I was always a leftist, but I operated in more liberal spaces because the world was kind of a different place then. Not in that, how do I explain this? 
I mean, I know I'm so predictable. I'm a broken record, but Bernie really was for a lot of people. Occupy Wall Street was this moment, uh, kind of a line in the sand and this moment, a watershed moment. For me, it was much more Bernie uh, because I pre I liked what Occupy did. I think it was very important. It didn't resonate with me that much on a kind of visceral level. Why not? Um, why not? I like the ideas. I didn't find it particularly aesthetically or culturally appealing. I'm just being honest. I didn't think it was like unattractive. I'm just, it didn't speak to me. It was like, I understood where it was coming from. I thought it was really good that it tapped into that anger and energy. I went down there a couple of times. I was certainly supportive of it. It just didn't like, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, again, it's not from a, a political perspective or there, there was, I didn't have a political problem with it. I'm just being honest about how it like lit me up or didn't light me up. Um, and I like protests and they do these studies about endorphins that, you know, your endorphins go up while you're in protest, but, it, and it didn't like bum me out. It just, I agreed with it. It was exciting, but more on a kind of intellectual level for me. Um, and uh, not intellectual. I would go out there. It was, it was good, but it wasn't for me. Bernie really was this because Bernie was, and Bernie, I think, you know, part of the reason Bernie happened was because of Occupy. So I don't want to, I'm not like d denying. No, no. I, yeah. yeah. And I, I kind of really understand what you mean, actually. And obviously Gavin and I were a little bit younger when Occupy was happening. I, re I remember, I think that we were maybe, uh, we were younger. Well, it didn't hit us viscerally, viscerally either. I think that's why we're probably just un trying to understand. I'm just kidding. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, we were, I, I, I was, I want to say I was like 13 when yeah. Occupy was happening. Yeah, yeah, so, I know. um, so, but uh, anyway, but with Bernie, I, I do feel like so many people who may have missed out on that, uh, you know, uh, uproar and uprising and maybe understanding uh, Occupy, right? It, it may have still been a little opaque for people, especially in, you know, middle America and not, yeah. you know, on the grounds of it and, uh, you know, doing all, all of the actual, uh, you know, happenings as they were in New York City. And obviously they took place ac across the country as well. Uh, but yeah, I would be interested to hear more about why you felt like Bernie Sanders was able to touch you and invigorate yeah. you in that way. He, what was so great about Bernie is Bernie is like people I, I grew up, you know, he, he sounds like my uncle. He could be my uncle. And some people sometimes think that like, uh, it's because we're both lefty secular Jews. That's part of it, but that's not it. Like I feel, I, I interviewed Reverend William Barber the other day and I feel a similar like emotional pull to him. And obviously we don't come from the same background. So it's not just a similarity. I mean, there's an authenticity, I think, to him. And what was amazing about Bernie is that he had the politics that a lot of us have, but he was actually a senator. Like that was what was so different about this is that this was a moment. And the reason I do think it was a, a kind of um, watershed moment was because a lot of people who pretended that they were more leftist than their centrist politics uh, allowed, that the centrist reality allowed for, right? So a lot of people were like, well, of course, I love Medicare for all. It just can't never happen. It's a great idea. Like, I'll be there when we can when no, no, count me in when the revolution comes. Um, and I kind of was friends with a lot of these people. And I kind of we all had this uns well spoken or unspoken. It was very spoken on my for me. But this idea that if the circumstances aligned, of course, we'd be fighting for Medicare for all. And then you get Bernie Sanders, who's come comes out. And he's been saying this, obviously, for like decades now, but he actually becomes politically viable to the surprise of everyone, including myself. And once that happens, and of course it wasn't a shoe in and of course the, the you know, DNC did everything it could to make sure he didn't get the nomination. But when you saw someone with those numbers catch on like that, it was no longer possible to pretend that these things were just fringe, nice ideas that the masses had to pick up on because we had to undo you know, decades of propaganda. It was the masses were there. It was just the political and media elites we're pretending that they weren't there, we're pretending it wasn't possible. You know, Hillary Clinton, a, a nice idea that'll never, ever, ever happen. That's what she said about, um, you know, yeah. uh, single payer. <laughs> um, so that was this moment that everything, I think, changed. And again, it's not like my politics changed. It's not like the world changed in terms of um, ideas and in terms of what people were doing, but it did change in terms of what was possible. And that did change everything. Yeah. I, I really do. I think it, it was a line in the sand. I think I it, totally it agree. divided people, you know, and people could no longer hide behind the the technocracy. They tried to do that still, but they could no longer that's hide. How, that's behind. why they had Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, no, right. I think you're absolutely correct, Katie. And, and just from my perspective, the exact same thing happened. And obviously, I'm a little bit younger than you. So I was still politically developing around the time that Bernie first declared his 2016 run. Uh, but it really did show me what was possible. It, it really put into terms that were concise and understandable uh, exactly what policies like a real person on the left should want. You know, obviously, I wanted 
um, you know, universal health care for people and all these other things. But he really like distilled it, I feel like, in a way that made it undeniable, especially with the you know lack of taking corporate cash and all that. It was a line in the sand, like right. you said. And I'm actually interested in something because this is a, a theme we've gone back and forth on a little bit on the show uh, and something that I've you know debated myself internally for some time. But I think uh, I've arrived at a conclusion that Bernie Sanders did the right thing by running, you know, as a Democrat at both times. Uh, a lot of people have said, like, including people like Ralph Nader and Shama Sawant, they said, like, oh, you should have challenged the establishment from outside the entire time. And, and I'm a third party voter. I voted for Jill Stein in 2016 and um, Howie Hawkins in 2020. So I, I certainly am sympathetic to the third party cause. And I hope that, uh, you know, it, it's able to take off in a serious way at some point. Um, but I think what Bernie did that was so important was that he did bring those values into the mainstream. Like you said, uh, you weren't really, you know, 100 percent sure uh, how to express yourself or I wasn't 100 percent sure how to express myself as far as policy until Bernie really brought these ideas into the mainstream. And I just feel like they would have been able to ignore him all the much more if he had sidelined himself yeah. as a third party. You know, if you think about what really uh, brought Bernie to prominence, it was that Democratic nominating process in 2016, where it looked like they were just going to coronate Hillary Clinton. And there was a few other like mealy mouthed people like Martin O'Malley or whatever. Um, but then Bernie was really able to take the country by storm because the media had to pay attention to him. He was also part of the Democratic primary. He was on the debate stage. He was actually right. making some noise. And I just feel like they wouldn't have been able to do that um, were it not uh, for him participating in the process. Now, maybe if he had been a bigger name, like someone like Jesse Ventura, who I really wish the Green Party had nominated last time around, they wouldn't have to deal with that because he already would have that name recognition. He'd already have that degree of clout and celebrity and experience, et cetera. Well, he did have the experience, but not the clout and celebrity among the masses. Um, th he was really able to become popularized and his ideas along with him uh, via the attention brought to him through the Democratic Party process. And, and even though he didn't win and even though he unfortunately, you know, kind of buckled and, and just endorsed Hillary and endorsed uh, Joe Biden, which, you know, I would have done differently if I were him. Uh, I still think overall he had his head in the right place when it came to mobilizing this movement, starting this movement, popularizing those, these ideas, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you agree. Yeah, I mean, I think the second time he was obviously he did have that recognition that you were talking about. So it doesn't that that doesn't apply to, to 2020. Right. If we're saying um, I don't necessarily disagree with your takeaways. I'm just talking about uh, the point you made about how it would how it made sense because of, you know, he wasn't in Jesse Ventura. But by, but I think, you know, by the time I think both times he probably had, I guess there's some wrestling fans who don't know who didn't know who Sanders was. I mean, there are a lot of people who didn't know who Sanders was, but there are a lot of people who don't know who Jesse Ventura is. Um, by the way, shout out to James Adomian, who does like the best impersonation of Jesse Ventura. It's really quite stunning. Um, so, I mean, also, can I just give a, the opposite of a shout out to the people who are always like, he's not even a Democrat about Bernie Sanders? Like, did you want him to fucking run mm -hmm. as an independent? Yeah, did you yeah. want him to run as something else? Like, these people They're are all shit scared the whole time that he was going to run as somebody uh, yeah. as something else, right? That, that same thing that they tried to, uh, uh, especially in, in 2016 when it was uh, like, oh, if Trump doesn't get it, he's going to run. And then if Bernie doesn't get it, he's going to run. And it's going to be the end of time. It's going to yeah. be the end of organized politics in America. Yeah. Um, I, I guess uh, taking, taking your point that, you know, he obviously did have more... Um, you know, name recognition, more clout. Uh, you know, he'd have run a very successful, gotten super close in, in 2016 uh, without the fuckery from the DNC. Who knows uh, what would have happened? Uh, would you have preferred to see him run a as a as a third party or as an independent in, in 2020? Like, are you asking from a strategic perspective? Do you, uh, it, I mean, I guess you could kind of take it however you want, because I, I understand that there's both that like personal side where yeah. it's like, you know, I want to see him stick it to the fucking Democrats and fuck those people. But also, I mean, do, do you think he made the correct calculation? Because uh, because sometimes I because sometimes I, I don't know. And I, I agree with a lot of what Gavin said also, uh, so specifically regarding this 2016 one. Yeah. Do I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think there's any way he could have won as a. Uh... Not this time. No, I think that As Gavin actually party, had a pretty I mean. good plan. Uh, I, I think Gavin's take on this in, in Gavin, you can give a, a better uh, spill of it. But if he would have run Democrat and then run independent afterwards, maybe having a better chance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've OK, go ahead, hey, Katie. I want to know. I mean, I've, I've always thought it made sense when people uh, lots of times are like mad at Bernie for I think the way he endorsed Biden was pretty not it was not a good look. I think he felt under pressure because of covid. Um, shout out to Biden and Simone Sanders, who encourage people to vote after the CDC said it was um, you couldn't have gatherings of 50 or more people. I try to bring this up as much as possible because it's so shameful and it's such a stain on our, our history or will become a stain on our history. But this was 
literally the Biden campaign, uh, like encouraging people to go uh, get exposed to to COVID. They told they said that it was safe to vote. Simone Sanders said so. The CDC f- folks have said it's safe. CDC has said it's safe for folks to vote. So they had said you can't gather more than 50 people. It was the exact opposite of that. And I think Sanders felt like he, he had to endorse. He had to kind of stop people from turning out um, for, for the uh, primary. And he tried to, I mean, I, I wish we had gotten some doctors to, to, to urge the, the primaries to be paused, the presidential primaries to be paused. And then uh, my, my fantasy is that they would have written a letter, said pause it. And then when Bernie said, yes, okay, we'll pause it. And Biden didn't. Um, well, there's a chance that Biden would, would, not really a chance, but let's pretend for a second that you know Biden and his campaign had any moral fiber to it. Um, they would say, yeah, we're going to pause it. And of course, if he hadn't, if he had said no, we would have, we would have seen what a ghoul he, he is. But, um, I think that Sanders only worked as a Democrat, uh, much to, as, as upsetting as it kind of is that I think that's true. That's how he, he had to run. And I think that, you know, his big contribution was trying to, and I don't know if I have any hope in the, I mean, I don't, I've no, I, I haven't, I'm, I'm not as much as an ideologue as I really should be for you, the sake of YouTube, you know, for clicks, I should have a very clear, um, like I ha- should have a slogan that I stick Fuck to. But- every Democrat, I swear to God, you're all yeah. fucking dead to me. I, I mean, there are, they are, I, I do think that I just don't know the solution. That's, that's what I'm, I guess I'm being honest about. And I don't know what the strategic solution is. I do think that we need to be a little bit more um, strategic in, in how we deal with the fact that there are Democrats who are elected and, you know, they're not going anywhere. And that doesn't mean you don't hold their feet to the fire, but we have to figure out how we're doing it. Um, because if we're, I actually think that we're getting to the point where some people are doing it in a way that actually just, you know, when you overly vilify certain people, you're actually creating like bunker mentalities for their fans and you're actually doing them a favor because people see it and they get protective of these people. Yep. And I think we need to make sure we keep our eye on on the on power. That's what this is about. This is about power. It's not about personality. Now, I think that Sanders is somewhat exceptional. Uh, I, I do. I think he's I don't mean ju- that just in the like, oh, my God, he's amazing. I think he's literally somewhat of an exception. Um, he's very, very politically shrewd, but I think he does act on. I mean, he's a politician, of course, at the end of the day. But I do think that and I let myself fall for his personality. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> but in general, we should try to just focus on the policies and yep. political pressure. Um, and I think that we have to be, you know, I don't want to be like a, I don't want to chide people because I think that's if we're talking about strategy, that's also very ineffective. Kind of yeah. like wagging well, your finger at people and telling them that they're not doing it right. Yeah, well, that's actually a great segue into something else we've been discussing and debating a little bit on the show, which is, uh, do you think Bernie Sanders currently is using his political power in the most appropriate or effective way? Um, obviously, he's been hugely influential with these infrastructure bill negotiations. And uh, Zach and I agreed that it was pretty gangster, actually, what he did as far as uh, setting the price higher and then negotiating down to three point five trillion or whatever. Anyone does. Like, yeah, how do you exactly. not know that, people? And this is why you, I, know. I know you guys have talked about Thomas Frank. Did you have him on or you just yeah. you oh, get yeah. him on? Yeah, Thomas Frank. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is why uh, Listen Liberal is such fundamental reading, because it's not that. Democrats don't know how to do this is that they choose not to do this. Like how old are you when you learn the idea that you start in negotiations, you start higher than what you want. And somehow it's like, it's, it's Sanders again is exceptional in this. Why is that? Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is a moment. I don't know where, and I said this, I did the Fred Hampton left the show and I think we have to be honest about how important leaders are just in terms of that aesthetic visceral level. Like I don't, it's not a good thing necessarily, but we live in a world where human beings and leaders and storytellers are very important. And yes, we need to focus on movements, but the things that really excites people and movements can excite people and movements can create community, but sometimes leftists um, can be a little bit too chiding of uh chiding of the cult of personality. And my thing is that like, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. It'd be great if we, we need to do both, right? We need to work, build the movement and also find leaders. Um, and the truth is every leaders are move people and mo- movements have leaders, moments have leaders, and we have to find some good ones or else it'll just be the bad guys who find charismatic leaders. 
Well, do you think, Katie, then Bernie, it's an accurate or um, rational criticism of Bernie Sanders then that he didn't use his position as a leader of the leftist movement, um, for example, to advocate for the marches for Medicare for all? Do you think that that was a uh, like a calculation he made politically or like what would explain that? Because I I certainly was a little bit disappointed that it's like it's like you said you were going to be the organizer in chief. Obviously, you didn't win. Uh, but now the organizing has fallen on your supporters, other Medicare for all people that still want the policy and still believe in the policy. Uh, why aren't you even getting involved there? So it's kind of this internal debate I've had where it's like, you know, he's clearly doing what he needs to be doing to the best of his abilities as the Senate uh, budget chairman. And, and like I said, he's influenced quite masterfully these um, negotiations. So I'm not trying to shit on Bernie at all. I think yeah, he's sure. doing great in that sense. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's possible for him to kind of wield a dual approach where he's both organizing the people uh, when it comes to protesting and marching and all that stuff and also using his influence in the Senate or if that's if one would cancel out the other. So if you're asking about the, um, I mean, the, the thing about Sanders is he's very bold. His ideas, his principles are, are extremely bold. And he's also a pragmatist. And he's also, and I don't mean that in a sellout way, the guy's called the Amendment King, right? So he's someone who was used to working from, as the New York Times famously said in a headline, it's stealthily, stealthily edited. Um, Sanders achieved victories through legislative side doors. And they changed that headline to um, through legislative side doors, Sanders achieved modest victories. <laughs> but um, I think that he's someone who, you know, repeat, hammers home certain points that are really basic and that we need to do. And people like to pretend that they're not viable and say that he doesn't do details enough. And we honestly, like pr presidents are not administrators. I'd rather a very great imaginative president who obviously will farm this stuff out to, to people like that's what the cabinet is for um, and policy advisors. But in terms of the Medicare for all uh, rally, it was I, I think I mean, I was a speaker. I couldn't go for uh, family reasons. So I sent in a, a, an audio thing, mm -hmm. but I, I, I participated. Sure. Um, and I still think we have to be honest about where we were at. Like we did not have the clout or the organizing skill and it's fine. We just started like we didn't yeah. have it to for the, what was needed to force politicians to show up and people well, are going to, yeah. Yeah. Just well, to jump in really quickly there, because I yeah. think that that's what, um, so, but what, what I think is important about that, though, is it's something that you mentioned earlier, and I just don't want to uh, lose it, sure. is you, you mentioned that the, the cult of personality is really important, and it's important to have leaders. Uh, do you think that it would be more beneficial to have leaders that I'm going to prioritize organizing instead of prioritize getting myself elected into Congress? Like, I'm going to be a leader that does not want to, you know, attain political power in specifically, but rather perpetually challenge power from the outside. I'm imagining a, a figure like, you know, uh, you, uh, you, somebody, uh, not to use Cornell West, but just as a figure, somebody who's never been inv involved in yeah. politics but has so much clout, right? So somebody in that ballpark, do, do you think that would be more effective? Well, there, there are different lanes, right? I mean, I'm not saying that in a cop-out way, but everyone does have different roles. So Cornell West is a public intellectual. Uh, Bernie Sanders is a senator. And then you have someone like uh, Reverend William Barber, who I did just have on, and they were launching a really important four-day Selma-like uh, Selma march in texas and they're demanding uh they have four demands um the voting rights act uh uh raising the minimum wage i should have these the four of them but go watch my show uh it's up it's my latest live stream is with him uh not now stay here don't leave this stream but um it's not really it really isn't either or i mean people just have their different places like you had martin luther king and you had lbj and you couldn't get civil rights um act without lbj he was like a prick obviously but you know, you work with, we live in a world, we live in the world in which we live. And uh, we need organizers in the streets. We need politicians who are, I mean, I think that the question is where we as individuals or we as a movement focus, as opposed to, do we want this person to be a different thing? Do you know what I mean? Like Sanders is who he is. He's in, he's a, a, a senator. Then you have organizers in there who they are. And then you have public intellectuals. And then you have celebrities who help you know, highlight certain causes. Um, then you have people doing the, you know, the door knocking. I think that one thing, though, again, the left can kind of be a bit of a downer when it comes to, we have to remember how important the movement is and building a mass movement is and knocking on doors is, but we also shouldn't like chide people for looking for, looking to leaders and looking for um, exciting things. And also we need to make organizing more fun. We have to figure out how to do that. Uh, and nonviolent, I think, I think nonviolent organizing needs to become more butch. I'm not sure how to do that, but we have to make it more badass to be nonviolent.
I know that probably sounds really corny and boomerish, but I think it's true. And it is badass. I mean, when you're like nonviolently resisting something, I'm not saying that I don't think that there's a place for, you know, physically defending people or protecting people and in, in, in doing that, having to throw punches. I just think that the way that we're going to actually win is not going to be through, you know, for better or for worse, armed uh, uprising. Well, yeah, because it kind of it will debase the movement's credibility, right? That's one of the things Gavin and I have been talking about, like setting aside the morality of the right. state's monopoly on violence. The fact of the matter is, is that we we're in the interest of winning popular support because we're progressive populists. We need a, a broad based movement of people. And if you start, you know, in, in pushing a violent agenda, that's just going to dis dispel people who would otherwise be interested. And one of my follow up questions and for you, Katie, is and it won't work. And again, I'm already just speaking to the people who are going to say, but it's we all know this. We understand the state is violent. We understand that repressive you know we, well you can read your Althusser or whatever no one's pretending that that poverty is in violence sorry i just have all these like i just know the comments that are no no you're you fine yeah like that it's like yes everyone knows that the status quo is violent no one's pretending that there isn't violence now and no one's pretending that um that there's some moral equivalent between uh violence that is uh challenging the violence of the status quo that is state sanctioned violence and actual state sanctioned violence. But yeah, I, I agree. It's not, we're not, we don't have the numbers and we don't have the arms. So, uh, but I'm sorry, I, I cut you off. You were going to. Oh, no. My only uh, follow up to that was is that we were uh, talking about this the other day on our show is that, like, how how do we as a left keep our standards high without portraying everything as a defeat and still able to, like, engender uh, new supporters? Right. Because, uh, you know, obviously, Gavin and I took a massive amount of shit for saying that if the three point five trillion dollar infrastructure bill gets passed, that that'll be a win. And and, you know, people are all like, well, if you say that that's a win, then we're never going to get anything else. And it's kind of like, how do you do the balancing act of, of, of saying that this is good and that, you know, people have done hard work and, and actually made a difference without saying that, you know, oh, yeah, now we can go rest on our laurels, essentially. Right. Go back to brunching, the leftist, br whatever the leftist brunching equivalent would be. Um, I don't know. The other thing is, like, we have to be honest and, and like, there is, we are in an echo chamber. And again, I'm not being downery or, or wagging fing my finger, but like, we are, we have, we have shows and I don't know. Like, what is our our role? Are you saying that in general on the left, how do we frame it? Or do you mean? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't shows, broadly or... limiting it to our show, right? Yeah, I wasn't yeah. like, well, how are you, Katie Halper, going to do that? I no, just no, mean, no, like, yeah. do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, you want to, yeah, again, I think that goes back to different different people having different roles. I think you need the constant outrage and you always need to be demanding more. And then you need to, that's a good question, actually, because there is like studies show, right? Like, like victories do raise morale. Um, but how do you do that without settling for crumbs? That's kind of like Trump pretended everything was a win to give red meat to his base. You know, we're winning. This is a win. Yeah. China's making us look like losers, right. like all this kind of shit. Right. But, you know, the idea that, he, you, oh, if you support Trump, you're going to be a winner. Like that was so fucking yeah, really important was, yeah. to people. Right. That yeah. gave them a visceral need. That helped them feel like they were part of a movement that was succeeding. Yeah. Right. Even yeah. though it was failing miserably. But How also, do we take that? Yeah, he did. He was very good at spinning everything as a win, but he was also very good at creating, um, you know, the en he could also blame everything on an enemy. You know, I, one of my favorite moments from Trump's uh, reality TV show that was, uh, you know, both elections basically, was uh, when someone asked him why he was audited. Someone asked him about his, uh, the IRA, uh, sorry, sorry, IRS, uh, his taxes, his scandal back in 2016. And he was like, well, they're targeting me. And they're like, why did they target you? He's like, because I'm extremely religious, which is so funny because the guy is so not extremely religious. And it, and the poor guy, he's like not anti-choice. He doesn't care about like transgender bathrooms. Like he even said that. And then the poor guy is like trying to keep up with these like total. I mean, I'm, I was going to say Neanderthals as if he's not a Neanderthal, but he's probably a, I don't know the humanoid thing. He's probably not a Neanderthal. He's something else. I don't know my like species well enough, but. I mean, I remember him saying to, I think it was, was it to Chris Matthews that, you know, women should be punished for having abortions, which the Republican Party was like, you're saying, that, don't say that. We don't say that. Of course, if it's a crime, if it's murder, that that makes so much sense. And, and the guy is just trying to, like, you know, pretend he has certain policies and he's go big or go home. So, of course, it makes sense that they, she should wind up in jail. Um, of course, Republicans know that it's not even even religious ones get that it's not murder, murder, um, which is why. I mean, they also get it would it would tank uh at the at the ballot box but um you know but that's another example again going back to the oh we need to build movements and we do need to build movements and i'm also tired of this like organizing porn kind of thing it's like okay we get it yes organizing is important organizer on the streets but like stop beating people over the head with not being organizers 
Like, I mean, I get frustrated with both sides because sometimes I get frustrated with the non-organizers who are just like, fuck this shit. Like this person, you know, like they need to earn my vote. That's all true. But it, let's just be, I mean, people, I sound so corny. I keep going back to the different roles, different lanes, but I, I think it applies to so much stuff. But um, I think that sometimes people can be like such kind of party poopers and naysayers and like, well, we have to do the hard work. Like no one's going to want to do that. Sorry, guys. If you want to build a movement, no one's going to want to be like, oh, good. It's a fucking pandemic. And there's uh, no, you know, we're in a like pre-apocalyptic uh, world hellscape. I'm definitely looking to to start do to start to do stuff that's more hard work. See, I could barely say that sentence. That's how unappealing it is. But like, let's also meet people where they're at. Um, and that's another thing that the left really has to do. But but that's an example. Like, let's just be realists. Yeah. You you want to? There are Donald Trumps out there. We don't need Bernie Sanders out there. Like, they have charismatic or anti-charismatic or to us unappealing. Although he, the guy is so funny. Donald Trump is so funny. Like most of the time, not intentionally funny. But um, we got to have people like that. And we have and we need more. Of course, we need more people. And then the other thing that drives me a little bit crazy is there's this like naivete on both sides where uh, and I get it because they're the world has like online left has divided into kind of two sides right now. But the idea that like, oh, stop vilifying, you know, AOC, we just need more AOCs like, no, that's not how it works either. <laughs> Like you have to make it politically uncomfortable for people not to do the right thing. No one's ever, it's not going to be like, there are going to be a bunch of them and they're going to start voting against like, like it's not like donor pressure is going to disappear. It's right. not like uh, the, the, the interest that, that even if they don't take corporate money, it's not like the corporate uh, influence that, that is on all their other colleagues disappears. You know, this is always, people are, people become part of the institutions for yeah. which they work or of which they're part. And uh, so that's another thing where it's not just having more AOCs. Um, yeah, I think overall, just a lot more nuances welcome into yeah. the conversation when it comes to organizing versus electoral politics, you know, mutual aid or yeah. electoral politics. It's seemingly always this like is, is one or the other. But yeah, in reality, it's, all of, it, it, of course, it's both. Yeah. Of course, it's both. And they work uh, in tension and like there is dynamic also. Yeah. Like you have a radical, you know, you push things on the outside and then. And then the politicians get to go and point to that and say, sorry, I have no I have no yeah. choice. And even the people that are extremely anti-electoral politics, most of them will concede that to get their goals accomplished, it's going to have to be done in some sense electorally. Like most of these people that are out there saying like only mutual aid, you know, right. completely screw electoral politics. Uh, they still support Medicare for all, which isn't going to happen without some legislation like you're. I'm right. sorry, but you, we're going to need it to be legislated at the end of the day. Uh, so it, I, I just find the whole thing stupid when people are like, it's one or the other. It's obviously yeah. both. Uh, I just wanted to quickly address uh, the Super Chats. Thanks so much, Das Bosha Flesha. Uh, I think the Super Chats are turned on. Sometimes YouTube demonetizes us. So maybe that's why it wasn't on oh, the last this stream. Is, yeah, no, the last um, the last crossword puzzle we did was last week. It's on. We took it down. Oh, we took them that down was directed to you. kind of boring. I gotcha. think to not do live watching me just try to do a crossword puzzle for useful idiots. <laughs> so we took it down so that people don't come to the channel and like oh, want gotcha. you know, to take a that's funny. I, I didn't head. know what he was referring to, but that's yeah, funny. We do, we do Matt Wilson, our uh, useful idiots producer uh, does write these crossword puzzles based on our, uh, on the shows, you know, so, and I, I should get, tell everyone to subscribe to both. Um, not, not ending this, just need to put it in there. Let's oh, see. Yeah, for sure. Patreon.com obviously slash the Katie helper show. And my YouTube is youtube.com slash the Katie Helper Show, and then Useful Idiots is usefulidiots.substack.com. But um, so, yeah, now, now you know that. Uh, I actually had a question about Useful yeah. Idiots, too. Really sure. quickly, just wanted to address these super chats, though. Uh, thanks. We'll, well, we'd love to talk to Peter Joseph, but really appreciate that $5 super chat. Really genuinely appreciated it. And then thank you so much, Holly, for the uh, 1999 super chat. Nobody is all good or all bad. Not Bernie, not Grimm, not Dorr. Uh, thanks, thanks for talking Holly. to people with a spectrum of viewpoints, not just those you agree with 100%. That's what we're trying to do here. We appreciate yeah. that you uh, dig the ethos. I've had all of those people on, by the way. I would say they're all worth talking to. And I, we'd love to have Bernie on. <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, if I, you I, have I, his contact, Katie, just yeah, pass it along. You know? I'm sure everybody in our chat would like that as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, speaking of useful idiots, I wanted to quickly uh, talk about that since uh, as we were oh, mentioning... Do you want to hear one I met about the one time? Uh, well, I met him... We had him on Useful Idiots, but also I met him at the Brooklyn um, Williamsburg Music Center. It's not called that. I know Music Hall, Williamsburg Music Hall, at during the uh, 2020 primary, and I everyone like got their photo taken with him, 
And oh, yeah? I went and I went up to him. I'm like, oh, I'm such a fan. And I uh, I wrote about the New York Times bias against you because I wrote this this article about this woman named Sydney Ember, who's at uh, the New York Times, who it was called Sydney Ember Secret Sources. I wrote it for FAIR, which is a great publication website. Everyone should check out FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Um, and then Jacobin printed it. And so, it, and it did pretty well because it was just a bunch of examples of how dishonest this woman was in her writing about Bernie. And she would cite all these people, like leave out the fact that someone she talked to was like the head of a Hillary Clinton super PAC. I mean, just total like media malpractice. But so I went up to him. I was like, oh, I, I, I wrote a, I write about you a lot. And that sounds like such loser shit. Hold on. I was like, I, I wrote this piece um, about, recently about the New York Times bias against you. He's like, I saw. Thank you. And then he's like, so you write. And then they took the photo or whatever. And he's like, so you write for FAIR? Which was amazing. Because it was like, he said it like it had two syllables, FAIR. Yeah. He does this thing That's where funny. he adds R's to words yeah, that no, don't I have know. it and takes it's them great. away. So it's like area and idea but then like blunder. <laughs> no, that's so true. And thank you for sharing that story. That's hilarious. But uh, I, I did want to uh, ask you about Useful Idiots a little bit. As people might remember, uh, we made a video about yes. Useful Idiots yeah. being canceled by Rolling Stone. And uh, of course, you guys were gracious enough to shout us out in your podcast, which was huge for our channel. So obviously, thank you okay, and yeah. Matt so much. That was that was awesome. And just a huge uh, thrill for us personally. Um, but I feel like uh, throughout all that stuff, I still don't exactly know or remember why the show got canceled yeah. there was so much dry humor uh so many yeah. so many good jokes on your and matt's part yeah. that i'm still honestly a little bit confused was it because of aaron mate was it what exactly now, was it no it's not that clear and i mean i i have to come up with some other reasons let's see did i do anything <laughs> uh uh premature solidarity with norman finkelstein's canceled culture book i'm sure they knew that we were going to do that um no, it wasn't. Honestly, we never got that many answers. Uh, and I think that, yeah, someone should do a deep. Weren't you guys going to do a deep dive and demand answers? You should do a really dramatic uh, trailer. I'm going like, to call up Jan Wenner right yeah, now. Exactly. And I'm going to say, get on the fucking phone with me, yeah. Jan. Yeah. Uh, how did this happen? Yeah, no. Yeah, we uh, got to but we got to expand it, that though. We you It know, seems we, crazy to me that that happened. And obviously Gavin and I have absolutely goose egg experience when it comes to working in, you know, real media of any kind and, you know, Rolling Stone is a large publication. It, it's really corporate, so I don't know what you can share and talk about it and and, and what you can't. But uh, from from our vantage point, when we were big fans of the show just as, you know, fucking consumers, I watched it all the time. And and it seemed like you guys were getting really good numbers. Like this had to have been like a profitable out yeah. Uh, thing for for Rolling Stone magazine. So at least you, the implication is that it was political, right? Like that's pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, I do think also you can have do like you can get really good numbers, and there are certain things that one uh, needs to do to monet to like monetize as much as possible from that. Do you know what I mean? And and I'm not sure how much that. So they was. wanted you to read like cringy ads or some shit before your podcast. Oh well, there's there's that, um, but. Uh, just even in terms of making short video clips, there's just a lot of stuff that has to happen. So I don't actually know. And I feel like because I wasn't, you know, Matt was working there, I should just defer to him. Not even doing that in a cop-out way, although I'm happy to hide behind Matt uh, whenever needed. But uh, he he had more of the relationship with them because he he worked there. I, I only, I had before this, I had pitched, you know, I'd, I'd written some articles, listicles. So like straight up, they just didn't even tell you why. They were just like, it's done, it's over. Yeah, uh, they they talked about it with Matt more, and you know I think it was it was a general you know things are you know tough money yeah. pandemic I blocked it out mostly. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's just fucking crazy. Like I said this on our video at the time that obviously you guys reacted to, but it's like why the fuck would you hire Matt Taibbi and Katie Helper to do right, a podcast yeah. and then be like that? I I just, I just don't understand it. I well, it don't. was also different. I mean, we it's interesting because we started the podcast when during the the primary and then the primary ended and it was we were actually we we were streaming live. I remember. I mean, not streaming live because it's not a live stream, but it's we were taping when we learned that Bernie Sanders had dropped out. And I was like, so angry. Um, and uh, yeah, it was an interesting moment, though. Uh, I definitely told them to cut out a bunch of like the curses because I was a little too, I think. I actually uh, forget that episode. Were you upset at Bernie himself for dropping out or were you just generally venting? Both. I think both. I thought it was too early. There weren't enough concessions. That was when he dropped out. He hadn't endorsed yet. Um, but yeah, I remember Dan Halperin. Shout out to uh, Rolling Stone uh, producer Dan Halperin. Also shout out to uh, Reed Dunley and Elvis Metcalf who worked on the show. Um, I remember Dan being like, uh, Bernie just dropped out. 
And I was like, what? Um, and we had Matt Stoller on that day. And then he, of course, slammed Bernie um, for whatever. And uh, yeah. Sorry, what was the question? I forgot. Oh, oh, uh, why? Yeah, the, the split with Rolling Stone. I mean, that's one. Obviously, there's also the Assad thing, the Yemen thing. Um, the, uh, you know, we wanted Assad to be our third co-host. Then we wanted a Yemeni kid to be one of them. So that also caused some conflict. Um, what else? There was some drama um, uh, with some Saudi stuff. They wanted, you know, MBS. They they countered with MBS having uh, Mohammed bin Salman being the third co-host, uh, not co-host. Tri-host, you, I Dwayne guess. the Rock Johnson, MBS, yeah. bottles of tequila ready. Yeah. Would have been a crazy ass show. Yeah, it would have been really crazy. Um, they also wanted, like, Matt really wanted the drum to, to do the opening song, just have a drum solo. That caused some some drama that we couldn't resolve. But, um, yeah. Overall, reflecting on it, though, you know, as somebody who's had a foot in, you know, a professional media gig and the, the, the independent world as well, you know, do, do you like it better just, you know, fucking being able to be your own boss, just, you know, going out like, I mean, I, I, as somebody who, you know, one, has never had the opportunity, but also just never really had the interest of, of, of doing anything like corporate at all with, with journalism, like, you know, I wouldn't get fired, fucking, you know, throw a rock anywhere. But uh, I'm just saying if I did, I, I, I find that I would be fucking frustrated by the oversight, the editorial yeah. board all of the kind of things that Gavin and I don't have to deal with. Like the only people we take shit from is the audience. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? And then you can just turn it off. They're, they're not your like boss. They just take your money away. You, right. know? Like, yeah. like, you right. know what I mean? Well, I think that there is always that. I mean, I didn't really, saw, I, I didn't deal, to be fair, we didn't deal with that much um, pushback or pressure um, or editorial pressure. But I do think to the extent that there was any, it was always, you know, having a huge platform. I, I do think infiltrating a more mainstream corporate space has it definitely has its advantages from a strategic political perspective um, in terms of reaching people. So, you know, uh, it has it, the energy is a little different now. Of course, it's it was already different because it's not in person. It wasn't in person. Um, I don't know. I think there's positives in both in both. But I, I do think that to be fair to Rolling Stone, they didn't they there were certain times, but in general, they didn't uh, pressure us that much. And also I just want to tell these delusional, weird, like trolls who think that they're trying to do like a, 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 a petition because we had Max Blumenthal on, uh, was part of it. No, you failed. That was a fail. We stayed on and you couldn't bring a single fact or a single receipt to debunk what Max said, which is why you always have to resort. These people always have to resort to smears, um, because they can't engage in anything substantive. So yeah, you had Max on right after he got arrested on some bogus yeah. shit, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we had him on to talk about getting arrested for protesting outside the Venezuelan embassy, which was hilarious. I mean, uh, we I did a funny I did a funny thing on that with um, when Max was on my show on the Katie Helper show. We talked about that. We watched the video of this woman who was like accusing him. She was like, "This this this guy, this man with pink um, what are they called? Code pink looked at me with a face so, full of so much hate and fear." And like stomped on me, just like, and the and the and the rumors were like he attacked an older woman, the woman who was this older Venezuelan woman. But then somehow it was that she was like pregnant, which was really funny because she would have been like in the world record of like oldest pregnancies. I mean, she wasn't that old, but she definitely was older than, you know, not to generalize, but it would have been a tabloid story had that woman been yeah. you know, pregnant. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't know if you saw our video the other day. Katie, um, but I thought one of the dumbest uh, points that was made uh, amid all the discourse the other day on Twitter about the margins for Medicare for all, this asinine talking point that, um, well, we could be marching for Medicare for all, uh, but shouldn't we really be working on Nina Turner's uh, election campaign as if, you know, the people marching for Medicare for all, as if you uh, weren't also a supporter of Nina Turner. Uh, and you said, you know, there are 40 Medicare for all marches happening. And it was like 56, actually. Yeah. Yeah. There were so many. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, uh, there were people that were uh, obviously trying to find issue, take issue with certain speakers for various reasons. I thought you pretty did a pretty good job of shutting oh, that down. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if on air you could respond to, uh, again, this this talking point that it's a profound waste of effort when there's less than two weeks to Nina Turner's election, um, that if she loses, it would be a huge defeat to one of the most strident public figures in favor of Medicare for all, which, of course, is true. But uh, again, it's not like you or anyone else was saying that we shouldn't uh, you know, elect Nina Turner 
Um, but yeah, yeah, I was just wondering if you have a well, response. So that, to that tweet that I did about the 40 uh, Medicare for all marches, that was not, uh, I mean, obviously that wasn't, uh, as people know, in response to the that other one, because that one came first. But it was just in response to the constant shitting on the protests. And you know what? I get it. There are people I never would have had speak. I get it. But like, you're also have to be used to that. If you're having a big tent uh, movement, that, that's going to happen. You could easily say that there are certain red lines or there are certain criteria. That's fine. But like, why? And I get the frustration. I also get the frustration. There are people who think that there are too many like pe- people criticizing the squad in a certain way. I get all of that. And people are like, you're free to have that opinion. But when you're spending what to whatever online presence you have, I mean, that's the other thing. I, to the extent that you have any any reach, like when you're spending that, just shitting again and again, shitting on uh this protest like you have to ask yourself why why aren't you tweeting about some other medicare for all like legislative thing happening why aren't you tweeting out a link for people to go knocking on doors or why aren't you tweeting out a link about how people can you know get their vaccine or do this that the other um like why why are you so obsessed with this and you know if it's one thing if you're kind of like providing alternative uh but i didn't see that yep. that much i mean i saw a lot of people shitting on and it's not like let's be, like i get it but it's not like the squad becomes i mean i think people need to articulate why i think pe- people need to articulate the the variety of viewpoints on how we how we can make a movement how we can be interacting with the squad what our demands can be but uh the idea that you're actually helping by just keeping track of every person you don't like who's in this this uh, march, I thought, was misguided uh, to be charitable. And, yeah, it's so um, dumb. Yeah, so I, dumb. I just didn't get it. And it's like, also, what's your what's the point? Like, let's say you're right. Let's say everyone. Let's just say, for argument's sake, I was one of those speakers. But oh, I had the video too. I because uh, they they sent it in. I sent it in, so they played it at the New York rally. But like, let's just say every single person in this is bad. Okay, you said that, and now what? Like, how many t- times are you going to say that? And you're just creating more fodder for people who already say that they're like unfairly attacked. Yeah. And also they just point to it. Yeah. And also like, who cares? It's called Medicare for all. The point is getting Medicare for everybody. Like, yeah, and it's, it's not like uh, people have this, I think kind of disingenuous argument or nonsensical maybe that like, Oh, this is going to ruin the brand. Like this wasn't big. No one's going to be like, Oh, I don't support Medicare for all anymore because the people who want it are means of the squad. They're like countless people. So many people were, do- were spoke there. And uh, you can critique certain individuals, but you just shouldn't ever be shitting on. Uh, I'm going to release a tweet. Uh, sorry, release a, a clip later tonight from my show that I did last Thursday. And Leslie Lee's kind of uh, what did he say? He was like, because Leslie Lee was really going after people who were going after the rally. And he said, he's like, I just don't know what's going on. Like when you're a socialist and you're like lobbying against healthcare, or Medicare for all rally, like that's kayfabe. And he explained to me what kayfabe was, which I didn't really know. It's a wrestling I don't know thing. what kayfabe is. Yeah, it's oh, a wrestling gotcha. thing. You'll watch. I'll, I'll, you'll have to retweet it so your people know. So they. Uh... Well, it's just dumb because, like, uh, I mean, obviously, there's this huge like split on the online left, at least, where people like either love Jimmy Dore and everything he's associated with, or fucking hate it and make it their mission to like destroy you. I think we saw that with Force the Vote too, yeah. uh, where a lot of people they didn't they, they either agreed at first or were ambivalent, but then as soon as you know Jimmy got really involved, obviously he came up with it, but as soon as he got really like intense about it, uh, people decided they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, but I mean, I'm trying to put myself in that mindset, and it's like if fucking. I don't know, like Sam Cedar or something are organized a march for Medicare for all or, or tried to do something. I, I don't love Sam Cedar, but I would still get it behind it. I'd still I wouldn't spend my day trying to sabotage his fucking march or his if Rachel idea. Maddow organized a fucking march. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't like spend my entire timeline tweeting on it and, huh. and talking about how much he sucks. Um, and I think that there we need to be uh, better about this stuff, like getting that we're not always going to all agree that we have to, there are red lines. I mean, I, I, I do think that what, I think that what, uh, and I don't want to give this more oxygen, but I, do, but why not? I do. And you guys talked about this a lot, but I do think that, um, you know, saying when the young Turks said what they said about Aaron Mate, that was just a smear. I mean, that was just lie. I mean, that wasn't true. And they said it. And the thing that really was terrible about that was like, they said it, they accused Aaron of working for the Russian, the Russians, um, and being a genocide denier. And then they didn't even wait a beat before they became the victims. Like, how is that possible? Like right away, they were, they were, this went off on people who were upset about that. 
like right away. Yeah. They and to be uh, and the only reason, by the way, in my opinion at least, that they went after Aaron in that way was because of his connection with Jimmy Dore, who of course uh, Tyt yeah. hates. Like if he yeah. had just been, uh, if he had never established that connection with Dore, I don't think they ever would have taken the time to go after him in such an ugly way. Uh, but clearly, they're so fucking resentful of that uh, of that beef. So you know, that was my reading of the situation. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was just ridiculous. And again, there was just no it was like there's such entitlement. There was no why not just apologize? Why not say, you know, I disagree with him. I think he's wrong on this or that, or the other. But he doesn't work for the Russians or I have no evidence that he works for the Russians. And all these smears are so lazy. Uh, it's so f- ridiculous to me as somebody who you know shoots from the hip constantly as the, on this podcast. Like, it's so odd to me that people are really reluctant to be like, yo, I fucked up. I was just yeah. screaming about shit on the podcast. I reacted to something that turned out to be wrong. That's egg on my face. Uh, I sincerely apologize if it damaged anybody else in any way. We all make mistakes. I'm sorry. We're going to pull the clip and run a retraction. Like, that's all you have to fucking do. Like, Gavin and I have done that yeah. multiple times. Like, right. we say something and I'm like, holy shit, that's not true. Fuck, I got to immediately get back on the microphone and tell everybody that we fucked up. Because yeah. I feel like that's what you do if you, like, actually care about this shit. Like, I don't want to go out and spread misinformation because it's going to completely debase any argument I have later on when I have real shit to talk about. You know what I mean? When I do have the nuts and bolts right. of, yeah. of what to say. So it just, it really, I mean, especially from an outlet that claims to be, like, progressive media or news. Like, I guess you could get away with not running a retraction if you're just like, I'm a loud mouth podcaster. I just say well, whatever the fuck what I, I want. But so they also have this whole veneer of like, oh, we're a news show. Like I get up and I wear yeah, like the adults in dress the up clothes and, and like, you know, finger wagging everybody who does this, you know, unprofessionally also on YouTube. Right. Yeah, so. that's the thing. You can't do you, like you have to pick a pick a lane. You have to pick a narrative like you're the responsible fact check, you know, people who are who don't engage in, in rants or. Or you're that yourself, uh, which makes your, you know, shitting on I people mean, for being sorry. I was just saying, I think you can be both. I guess you, yeah, you can be both, but, but I, I mean, I'm using those, I'm, I'm using that framing because I think that that's what they often will accuse others of being. Um, well, I think, I think on our side too, there is a little bit of uh, blame to go around. I think people on, you know, that tend to fall on our side are quick to call other people CIA agent or you're an yeah, asset. I mean, yeah, like, I, I that's think, pretty cringy too. I think there's cr- the cringe thing is the grifters versus neoliberal shills uh, dichotomy. And it's like people should just get paid fined every time they say that we should find some like shared charity or mutual aid thing that we can agree on because it's just so stupid and annoying. And like yeah, the establishment versus the grifters, Russia, Gator, Russia, you know, Putinists versus sellouts like there is uh, there is some. And, and, well, that was actually know, the real reason we had you on the show today, Katie, was want, Gavin and I were Putin? under some for, from under some financial duress. And we were hoping that you could make a few calls to the Kremlin for us, get, you know, get really get us. Yeah, get, get us really rolling in that in that gravy from Russia. Yeah. And that borscht and that. Yeah. And that borscht, um, that borscht train. Uh, yeah, it's just I don't know. I mean, it's I do think I, we were talking about this last week, was it? I think with Jordan Sheridan on, I think it's in our sub stack only for useful idiots, but we were talking about how there should be some kind of who, like if there's going to be more, anytime there's real beefing uh, on the left, there should be, we were, I think we were talking about how, you know, they're like Jank and, and, and Jimmy shouldn't, if, if they are streaming, like is at the same time as some important story, they should just like pause and give and, and like seed to that important story. You know, like Jordan has this Flint, Michigan, really important um, Jordan and Jen at status quo of this really important story that we actually covered at Useful Idiots this week. But I think we I think we had met Taibi and I worked out that it was going to be something like they'd have to have a fight and then donate their proceeds to another like another show. Um, so we can try to, you know, turn this into good. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, I did want to quickly address the super chat. Do you have any comment on the Russia Gate attacks from Josh Fox? I'm I'm not familiar with those, but I guess Brian wants oh. to know. Oh well, hi Brian. Uh, yeah, he he accused. Uh, that was when he accused me, and uh, this all relates to the Michael Moore film, oh, uh, yeah. Planet of the Humans, and he yeah. said that uh, Lee Camp, Matt Taibbi, Max Blumenthal, me, Aaron Mate. Uh, and Putin, we were all like pushing these these Russia talking points, and that's why we had Michael Moore on the show. And he said that on Nomiki Konst's show. And then I went on Nomi show, kind of assuming, you know, that like there was going to be a rapprochement and like, sorry, that was so ridiculous. Yeah. And the, the setup of it was Nomi saying, well, you know, I think he needed to be more nuanced about Josh Fox and 
well, the best thing about it was Josh Fox was like, look, I'm not going to name any names. But, and then 13 seconds later, he was like, Jimmy Dore, Katie Halbert, Matt Taibbi went through the names of people who are allegedly like, I, I think to be fair, it wasn't that we were knowingly, we may have just been assets pushing oh. uh, Putin talking points. Well, that's I what think. we are. Yeah, right. So there are yeah. shades of gray. I appreciate that I wasn't like a an intentional Putinist. But he said that, and then Nomi had me on and said, uh, you know, he needs to be more nuanced, but to be, but, uh, and if you, you have to, if you say someone's pushing Putin talking points, no, no, it was like, he needs to be more nuanced, but at the same time, if you say you're not pushing Putin talking points, then you have to explain that too. I, well, I, I, remember I was the like, whole... no, that's not how it works. It's I not the... one need to be more nuanced yeah. and at the same time, you have to, the burden of proof that you're not pushing Putin talking points is on you. Was the whole Planet of the Humans thing, did they accuse Michael Moore of making that film or producing it on like behalf of Russia? Because I remember all the controversy, but I didn't actually remember that the McCarthy shit, McCarthy yeah, shit got brought Yeah, which was funny because it's not like Michael Moore is this big, uh, you no, know, he, he was doesn't Russia really call himself. out Russiagate stuff. Uh, so it was very, very funny. But yeah, that was it. Uh, I mean, it was just so lazy. It's like people are just so used to when it, when it, when all else fails, like just throw out Putin, just throw yeah. Putin's name into That's the, so into the mix. Dumb. Yeah, that's so dumb because, yeah, Michael Moore, literally it, w one of the uh, criticisms I would have is that he probably went along a little bit too much with some of the Russiagate nonsense. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's yeah, I think that's and I love Michael Moore, funny. by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we lost your mic, Zach, you're muted. Oh, I was just saying that he's an yeah. influence to the both of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that but anyway, I think that was most of what uh, Gavin and I had prepped with you. I know we're about at an hour, Katie, you're a busy lady. We want to give you back the rest Thank of your you. evening. Uh, but it was so uh, so fun having you on to chat. Hopefully we yeah. can do it again. It was a real uh, treat engaging with you. It was, thank yeah. you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much, Katie. We're huge fans of your show. And obviously, although everyone in our subscriber base is probably aware, if you're not, definitely go subscribe to the Katie Helper Show to Useful Idiots. Support Katie at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Uh, you really are one of my favorite voices in this space. And Thank you so much for your Thanks. time today. Thanks so much. Anyway, that was awesome. Thanks again, Katie Helper. Uh, that was a pleasure to talk, and uh, we hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. Um, did want to quickly shout out our patrons again before we jump off for the day. Uh, thanks so much to everyone supporting us on patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. That link is in the description below. We shout out our patrons at the beginning and end of every live stream. And we also give them special benefits like access to our Discord server, uh, early access to book club episodes, um, priority in our monthly Q&As, which is coming up later uh, very soon. Uh, so thank you so much. And I accidentally didn't share the other one, but give me one second. Did you have anything to say, Zach? No, obviously, just that it was super fun being able to talk to Katie Halper. Always, uh, you know, a treat to talk to somebody whose show you really enjoy and, and all that kind of shit. So uh, shout out to Katie for taking the time to come on our uh, show. It was an awesome time. And shout out to our Van Guardians and our comrades and everybody that listens to our show. You're all comrades to us. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody. And we'll be back uh, tomorrow, I believe, with the interview with Steve Cox. Yeah, yeah. Stay tuned for tomorrow. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. We got a lot of uh, great more interviews coming, a lot of good content. So again, thanks so much to Katie. Thank everyone for tuning in. Really genuinely appreciate it. And everyone have a beautiful rest of your Monday. And we would love uh, getting Chris Hedges on the podcast, by the way. I just saw the super chat jump in right after Zach jumped out. Uh, but we would absolutely love to get Chris Hedges on the podcast. Um, so yeah, no luck so far, but the, this, the quest continues. Anyway, peace, guys.